Riot was formed in 1975 in New York City by childhood friends Mark Rialli and Peter Battelli. They'd find bassist Phil Fiette and vocalist Guy Speranza and record a handful of demo tracks which eventually got them noticed by indie label Fire Sign Records, the owners of which would also become the band's managers. We'll call them Billy and Steve. Billy and Steve would apparently talk the band into a contract that several members had reservations about, including recently added second guitarist Lou Coveras and bassist Phil Fiette. In fact, Phil would actually leave at this point and be replaced by Jimmy Iommi. Eager to start making an album, the rest of the band signed on anyway and began recording their first album, Rock City. Rock City! Rock City! Be what you wanna be! Rock City! We did that album so quickly it was ridiculous. It took maybe two or three months to do. It was really out in 76. It says 77, yeah. but it was really out in, in 76. The album cover features the first appearance of the Riot mascot, Tior, a sort of seal centaur. A seal tour? I don't know. Anyway, he's out for revenge for being hunted by humans. I think. Rock City is just freaking great. It really bridges the 70s classic rock sound with heavier riffs. It's packed with aggressive, energetic tracks, along with more melodic, radio-friendly songs. And Guy's unique voice easily handles both. This is what I get for loving you. This is our attempt at a hit single that you know it was it was the end of the album they just threw it on there that sound that you hear is called backwards echo you know that that was a backwards echo so this was our attempt at a, a hit single because they would they were trying to get that unfortunately america wasn't quite ready for it yet they were a very courageous band ahead of their time you know that that phrase gets thrown around but this is a band that really was ahead of their time The album didn't get much attention until it got into the hands of Joe Anthony, a radio DJ in San Antonio, Texas known for breaking in new rock bands. This led to wider exposure for the band and some southern touring dates. However, in the middle of the tour, either Billy and Steve or Mark or all three would make the decision to remove Lou from the band without any explanation. I woke up in the morning and there was nobody there. Like I said, I was kind of like left in the, uh, the lurch there, I didn't I? So that was it. The very, very next day, I got a phone call saying that my services were no longer needed. He was replaced by one of the roadies, Rick Ventura, as Riot began recording their second album, Narita. <laughs> this time, the mighty Tior is gonna sumo your ass. Look at how many people he's taken out already. I can only assume that plane behind him is mankind's last attempt to stop him from global domination. The first album was a little raw, but it was good. And the second one, you know, people get better, you know, and you feel more relaxed. Narita is just as good, if not better, than Rock City. This album pushes even more into a harder sound with extended solos and phenomenal musical arrangements, like the instrumental title track. In 
Guy takes it up another notch too with some outstanding vocal performances. Still managed by Billy and Steve, Riot was now on Capitol Records because Capitol needed an opening act for Sammy Hagar's UK tour. However, as soon as the tour was over, Capitol dropped them. And somewhere around this time, either Billy and Steve or Mark or all three would make the decision to remove Peter from the band without any explanation. Peter would be replaced by Sandy Slavin and bassist Jimmy Iommi would be replaced by Kip Lemming as well. I think Mark was was a, a quiet guy, not not a, not exactly uh, a people person. I think essentially what happened there was he just kind of went along with whatever management was essentially telling him. This could be various managers. They had they had kind of a weird network of managers over time. It could be label people. It could be influence from anybody. So I, I have a feeling this idea of just sort of dropping people is that he didn't kind of know how to handle it all that yeah. well. I think he's more of a he's more of a puppet figure in the whole thing and just kind of going along with what everybody's telling him to do. Meanwhile, Billy and Steve were working to get Riot as much radio airplay as possible. The plan worked and Capitol picked Riot back up for their third album, the epic Fire Down Under. It looks like Tior has finally won the battle against humanity because on the cover he's just like, hey, what's up? Look at all the destruction in my wake. As for the album itself, it's the best Riot album so far and one of the best early heavy metal albums ever. It's aggressive, the production is great, and both the songwriting and the vocals are just insanely amazing. For 1981, it might have been a little too aggressive. In fact, Capitol didn't even want to release the album until a fan petition forced them to. Capitol considered Fire Down Under to be too heavy, despite the massive fan support. Yeah, well, we came up in the, uh, the punk period, so we were like sort of out of place, you know, the whole focus was on punk. So there wasn't many bands like us, you know, and that's probably why, you know, we were a bit underground, and uh, but we just stuck to our roots. With the LA metal explosion still two years off, it seems like 1981's Fire Down Under came just a little too early, despite breaking into the Billboard 200. While Riot definitely had their packs of loyal fans, the lack of support from the labels was starting to get to the band. This would be one of several factors that would contribute to Guy's decision to part ways with Riot in the middle of supporting Rush on their Moving Pictures tour. You know, we were touring with Rush at that time, and, uh, you know, John, Guy just, uh, he had enough of it. It was, it was always a constant struggle. We, we were just always a struggle. Um, with management, with record companies, there was always an issue and he just became more frustrated. We all became frustrated. Everybody in the band was, was very just ticked off at, at the grind and not really getting anywhere and not really getting paid and not really making very much money. So all of these factors come in and, and yeah, you lose your lead singer. That's of course one of the biggest things in the world. Some, some bands recover, some bands don't. Guy would be replaced by Rhett Forrester, a very different singer with a very different personality. Rhett 
would record two albums with Riot, 1982's Restless Breed and 1983's Born in America. On the Restless Breed cover, Tior is in front of a Tromaville skyline and seems to be either disguising himself as a human child or morphing into one. But he's also in the moon, so I guess anything's possible. On the Born in America cover, we see two Tiors. Maybe these are Tior's kids, and they're continuing to infiltrate the American population, sumo style. Rhett, it was like, uh, it was new blood in the band, uh, new excitement, a different sound, a different singer. Rhett is really interesting. He's a versatile singer, but at the same time sounds like a mix-up of a bunch of other singers to me. At points I hear Sebastian Bach, Dick Manitoba, Vince Neil, even Getty Lee. I can see you Just look at him, man. You know, his <laughs> presence just says it all, you know? Leather chaps and uh, the hair. And, but he's a very sweet guy. He was such a, yeah, really, really nice guy. Musically, both albums kind of range from 70s influenced hard rock to flashy, rebellious metal. Born in America does lean more into the 80s sound, and we finally get a Riot Music video for the title track that fully illustrates the band's new reject authority attitude. In the video, a kid is smoking a cigarette and watching TV in his room, but his dad catches him. The dad pushes his son into the kitchen and pulls a knife on him. The dad slaps his son and the son slaps back, then leaves because he's late for school. Already having a rough day, the kid tells a really hilarious joke in class. But the teacher drags him out, and the rest of the class won't stand for it. The kid gets taken to, I assume, the principal, but the other kids from his class all come to back him up, especially the one in the white scarf. He's really fed up. The kids tie up the teachers, apparently there are only two at this particular school, and run outside to smoke cigarettes and listen to heavy metal. But first, they raise a Tior flag. Finally, just to make things a little more confusing, Rhett rips his face off to reveal Tior underneath. I really like both of these albums, a lot. Not as much as Riot's first three, I think these sound a little less focused than those, but still, these are both very easy albums to listen to. Riot was dropped again by Capitol between these albums, with Born in America being released independently and self-financed by Steve, who at this point wasn't getting along with Billy. And those weren't the only issues the band was facing. With no label and no revenue, Riot would decide to break up not long after. Mark would move to San Antonio for a while, where he'd hook up with friend and Riot fan Don Van Stavern. After a few unsuccessful attempts to get Riot going again, they'd end up back in New York with Steve. They'd bring on drummer Mark Edwards and singer Tony Moore to record a few songs before other commitments would cause Edwards to leave. They'd bring on Bobby Jarzombic and sign with CBS Records for their 1988 release, the even more epic Thunder Steel. The cover features some kind of awesome sci-fi comic book cover with no Tior. Civilization probably crumbled under his power. I mean, how effective of a ruler could he be? He's a seal. Anyway, I absolutely love this album. It sounds exactly how the cover looks, and every track on it is memorable. including Blood Streets, which got a music video. Here we see Tony Moore walk out through some red smoke. The band is standing behind him for extra muscle, I guess, while Tony tells us a little about himself. And 
once things really kick in, we go back and forth between a rooftop and a black box theater as the band continues to rock out. With a much more European power metal sound than earlier albums, Thunder Steel is full of interesting compositions and musical passages to accompany the soaring vocals. I mean, Riot, I, I think they, they changed radically, and that's what a lot of people think. I mean, a lot of people uh, also really swear by those, those two records, the, the CBS uh, years records, uh, uh, Thunder Steel and Privilege of Power. The Privilege of Power from 1990 is mostly along the same lines as Thunder Steel, although it's a little more experimental. Plus, we see Tior once again on the bank of television sets on the album cover, so that's cool. This album does have a more 90s feel than Thunder Steel, partly due to the addition of Tower of Power, a horn-driven R&B band on some songs. There are also a lot of sound effects and some social commentary bits before a lot of the tracks, but Privilege of Power still has room for the European power metal influences that were front and center on Thundersteel. I also have to note that Bobby Jarzombic's drumming is just insane. Mark kept it going, you know, he just kept on going, he always wanted to play and just picked up new members along the way and tried yeah. different things, you know. There'd be another lineup shakeup after this album, mostly due to issues with management and no label support. We were being handled by the wrong people. The circumstances of, of the guy who was our manager on paper, um, that, that, that was not healthy, this guy didn't know what he was doing. Once those guys cranked it up and, and I got on stage, you know, it was all good. But everything else sucked. And I thought to myself, honestly, fuck this. <laughs> Bassist Don Van Stavern would leave to be replaced by Pete Perez, and singer Tony Moore would be replaced by Michael DeMio. They'd also bring on a second guitarist at this point, Mike Flintz. Riot would record six albums with essentially this lineup, although Bobby Jarzombic would kind of come and go. They'd kick off the DeMio years with Nightbreaker from 1993, a pretty straightforward hard rock metal album with outstanding guitar work. Plus a pretty boring album cover, frankly. Not sure what that bird is doing, but it's probably not too safe on that sign. I like this German cover better. Powerful tracks with high quality guitar solos would pretty much be the sound over the next few albums, with varying degrees of quality. Drummer John Macaluso would join Riot to record 1995's The Brethren of the Longhouse, which is a surprisingly good album, even if the video, eh, isn't. Wow, 
Like the album, the video for Glory Calling has a very loose Native American theme at the opening. Otherwise, it's just Mark and the two mics, and I have to assume one of their friends with a camcorder just rocking out in the forest. This album would also mark the final collaboration with Steve. Bobby Jarzombic would return for 1997's Inishmore, another great entry from this period. This album has a sort of loose Irish theme, but the music video for Angel Eyes makes no mention of it. In this video, we see an attractive blonde woman who just wants to get on the subway. She looks around nervously as the band starts to follow her. Mike DeMio appears to be fantasizing about riding around with her on a badass motorcycle, but he spends the rest of the video just walking behind her while Mark and the other Mike solo away. Sons of Society from 1999 is also really good. Again, the songs are pretty standard, but the guitar and solos are the star of the show. If you love just good metal guitar work, this album won't disappoint either. Plus, Tior is back on the cover. Although I'm not really sure what he's up to, does he know the bridge is out? And he's dressed like an evil monk for some reason, but he does look like he's trimmed up since he's been gone. After Bobby Jarzombic left to join Judas Priest, Bobby Rondinelli would play drums on what is, in my opinion, the most skippable album of the DeMio years, Through the Storm. Everyone plays well and the production is excellent, but overall it's just a fairly lackluster album compared to the others. Finally, 2006's Army of One, with drummer Frank Gilchrist on board, would take things back up a notch with some livelier tracks and more energy overall. Plus, look whose reflection is in the guitar. Me and Mark spent three years working on that record by ourselves alone in my little room. And we would talk about music for two hours, and then rehearse for two hours, and then talk about after Army of One, Mike DeMio would leave to focus on another band, The Lizards, and Riot would spend a couple years touring with singer Mike Torelli. Then in 2011, the Thundersteel lineup plus Mike Flintz would reunite to record a brand new album, Immortal Soul. <laughs> The album cover is some kind of terrible LSD nightmare, but I do kind of dig the idea of a skeleton handing an electric guitar to a guy out of a grave. Musically, this is a worthy follow-up to Thundersteel and The Privilege of Power, even if it isn't really breaking any new ground at this point. Of the three studio albums that I did with Riot, um, Immortal Soul, far and away, is the best sounding of the three of the three records. Sadly, Mark Reale had been dealing with lifelong health problems, and by this point wasn't able to physically work on much of the album. He would pass away from complications with Crohn's disease the following year. With the band leader and only consistent member gone, it seemed like Riot would be done for good. But Mike Flintz, Frank Gilchrist, and Don Van Stavern decided to carry on Mark's legacy by forming a new era of Riot with the blessing of Mark's father. A couple of 
of hurdles there. The first one was do we continue? And uh, I think Aaron Mark's dad, uh, Aaron Mark was only child. And he was said, Mike, please, you know, continue on. Do it for Mark. And we had to find the right people. You know, after that, we lost a couple members, you know, besides Mark's passing. And uh, we were fortunate enough to get these cats. Along with guitarist Nick Lee and singer Todd Michael Hall, they formed Riot 5 since Todd is the fifth singer for the band. I, I wasn't even sure if I could do it. I, I really didn't. I told Donnie when he was there, I wanted to go, well, give me a set list. I'm going to practice singing this at home and see if I can even sing this. Yeah. I remember being younger when Thundersteel came out. I thought, oh my God, that guy's on helium. Like, who can sing that? Todd Michael Hall definitely can, and so far Riot 5 has released two pretty great albums, starting with 2014's Unleash the Fire. For this album cover, we got a new and improved Mighty T Orb. He's got a cool new electric axe, which he's raising with some kind of cyborg arm, at the center of Reality Way and Blood Street. Unleash the Fire is a solid power metal album and a great tribute to Riot's past, with multiple references to previous albums and two songs dedicated to Mark. Each album really captures the feel and sound from various eras of Riot. But I have to give the edge to Armor of Light, their 2018 album. It's got a great balance of European and US power metal vibes through the whole album. And on the cover, we get a gang of Tiors. And the main one is either a new Tior or he got his cyborg arm fixed. Either way, he's clearly ready to kick some ass, and so is Riot 5, so check them out at the links below. I also want to give a huge thank you to The Metal Voice for letting me use their interview clips for this video. If you're into metal interviews and reviews, I'd highly recommend checking out The Metal Voice on YouTube. You can find the links to the full interviews in the description below, as well as a link to part one of Jimmy K's three-part Riot documentary, Fight or Fall. It goes even more in-depth into the history of Riot, with way more interviews and band footage. Now, your homework for this week. Rock City, Narita, and Fire Down Under, of course. I'm also going to put Restless Breed on here. I like it just a little bit more than Born in America, and Thundersteel is a must and Armor of Light from Riot 5. And don't think I'm dismissing the Demio albums, I would also wholeheartedly recommend The Brethren of the Longhouse, Inish Moore, and Sons of Society. And that's Riot. I hope you'll dig into this criminally underrated band. They go through a couple different phases, but they're all pretty great. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.